Hi, and welcome back to Recovery His Way on the campus of His Way here in Huntsville, Alabama. I'm Stuart Whiting, and I'm sitting down once again with our director, Tom Reynolds. Hey, Tom. Good to be with you. Good to be with you, too. And we're going to start in earnest on a series that we introduced last week, looking at the 12 steps as they have been brought to us through the Alcoholics Anonymous mm -hmm. um, uh, movement. And we know that they're rooted in Christian principles, as you outlined mm -hmm. last time we talked. And we really want to kind of uh, go into that even more and see how uh, we use these concepts in a broader biblical teaching with our residents here. Is that a fair way to say what we're going to absolutely, be doing? Absolutely. I think it's important that we, um, you know, one of the things we're trying to do, a lot of cases, programs, Christian programs tend to shun AA a lot of times. And I think seeing their root, which we talked about last week, trying to really see their root is not is not um, adverse to ours. I mean, it's the same root. It's coming out of the same thing. So just utilizing these ideas to work together and just embellish them with Scripture and really um, flesh them out with Scripture, I think, is one of the things that we try to do around here as part of our program. Yeah, and I think if, if there is anyone listening who may has some, for some reason, has a hesitation to the idea of AA or the 12th step, um, seeing in this light will be really helpful. And I've already likened it to, you know, if you're if, if you're part of a church community and the preacher has done a 12, you know, uh, series, lesson series on some topic, this uh -huh. is kind of the same thing in that, um, you know, we, we've seen someone's idea distilled down. But let's broaden it back out now and see the biblical principles that help inform what got distilled. Absolutely. Absolutely. So we're going to uh, begin with the first step. But before that, you wanted to make some correction well, <laughs> from last week. Yeah, was, when I was talking about the history, one of the things that I uh, mentioned was that uh, the AA book um, that was original, I think I said it was originally published in 1955. That was the second edition. So that's when the 1939 was the original published date. Um, that first came out after you know Bill W and Dr. Bob worked on it. Right, I remember. I remember you talking about that because they were they were working through the twenties right. and thirties, and then right, right. I didn't didn't question when you know back then things just maybe took a little longer to get public. <laughs> and so thirty nine, so it's been a little over eighty years Correct. that it's been in print and that's right. Part of and the I have like I said, I have here the third edition, and there's been a lot of editions since then. But I was given this as a gift by the one who introduced me to. AA yeah. a. originally, and so I've always kind of cherished it. He wrote some special things in the front mm -hmm, to me mm -hmm. that have always kind of formed my um, perspective regarding it, and uh, and so I've always cherished that book. He recently passed away, and so I really uh, mm. cherish his memory, and so I always hang on this book as kind of a reminder of that. So um, I, I mentioned last week these are new to me. I, I know I've seen them before, but I, I don't. I'm not a part of any group that's going through these. So maybe um, each week I'll start and I'll read out the step. Sure. And I, I've got a list of them because uh, it's kind of good to have an idea of what all 12 of them look like. But we'll just go through these one at a time. And, you know, it's going to be part discussion, part Bible study. It's going to be a little bit different format for us. And right. I think it um, would be helpful for me if no one else. And uh, and I think it will be great <laughs> for those who wonder, uh, what do you teach when you teach the Bible? Well, here's a shape that we put in some of these biblical truths Absolutely. into a recovery scenario. Absolutely. So the first step is we admitted we were powerless over addiction and that our lives had become unmanageable. Right. Yeah, and the, the key operative words are obviously admit. Every every one of these steps has an action to it. There's some choice. There's some mm. intention I put into it. So in this case, admitting is the first step. And it, it really begins, therefore, with the idea that change requires a confession. You know, we'll use, you know, the Christian admit. circles, we use confession. But, you know, in this case, admit, same thing. And, and uh, you know, you think about that because... You know, any time I change something, one, I have to admit that the way things are isn't hmm. where I want them to right. be. If I decide I want to lose weight, I have to admit that I'm overweight, right? That's an admission, a confession that has to take place. Um, any kind of change requires that. If, you know, if we, if we decide to paint the house, we have to admit that it's not in good condition. We want to put it in better condition. So um, it's just change requires step one is admitting. Um, and I think that's an important process, you know, in, in repentance, um, you see that, I mean, when, when, G, when John the Baptist came to prepare the people for Jesus in Matthew chapter three, for instance, um, he's preaching this gospel, this good news of the kingdom and the coming of Jesus. And he prepares the people for Jesus arrival with this um, confession, this open admission of their sinfulness and baptism. 
And um, that basically is just kind of God's way of getting the people prepared, ready for when Jesus arrives, they'll recognize him. They'll be positioned. Sometimes I've likened it with um, the guys when I teach this in classes to uh, going to a parade. Um, you know, the first thing you put at the beginning of a parade usually are fire trucks and, and police cars. Um, and the reason you do that is because everyone's milling about, mm -hmm. ready for the parade to start. You're not real sure when it's going to start. It's not like you have, you know, clocks that kind of got that succinct. And so the sirens become the way to say, hey, you know, right. you need to be done getting your cotton candy. It's time to get on the curb. The parade's starting. And so... Um, John the Baptist kind of is that character and trying to prepare the people, get everyone set for when Jesus arrives, they'll be ready to see it. So admitting that confession, that readiness to change is really the first step in this you know, process. We run into that every uh, month when we have our uh, monthly graduation. We we have to find a way to get everyone ready to go and we'll have a big song or, right. you know, you do dim lights. and But, you know, it made me think Maybe that fire trucks or police cars. <laughs> fire trucks would work really well. You know, so... John the Baptist is serving that, and so there's usually going to have to be a, a message or a moment of, of you know, that person coming to recognize that they need to change. I know we see a lot here that it's a family member that wants to do that, and they say, hey, this guy needs to change. Right. What, what, do you, what would you say about the history of people that, you know, do come in the program, but it's only because someone else tells them that they need to change sure. and maybe they haven't come to that yet. Right, right. And and what's, what's key to that is they ultimately have to come to that. Now, um, it's not bad for a family member to do that. I mean, a lot of times people say, well, he's just here because he didn't really want to be here. He's just here because the courts are making him go or his mom is making him go or his wife is going to divorce him. He didn't right. come. Um, and that may be the initial reason. I mean, think about it. Um, most people, when you read through the scriptures, went to Jesus for less than mm. spiritual altruistic reasons. I right. mean, the, the one thing you see with Jesus is that people are going for the miracles, right? They're going to be, you know, feeding the 5,000, the um, raising the dead, um, uh, you know, the lame man. These various people, a lot of people are coming to Jesus and rallying Jesus because they're looking for the miracle. Um, and that's ultimately what Jesus is trying to do. But then he has to take that situation and turn it to um, to the real intention and purpose. And we have to do the same thing here. We have to, you know, I think what happens a lot is guys are suspicious. They have a lot of preconceived ideas about what recovery is going to be like. A lot of times what we find is that when guys get here, they get comfortable. They start feeling like these people really do care about me. All of a sudden that begins to shift mm -hmm. and they begin to come to an admission. They become to a confession in which then they're ready to change. And so... Um, but that's a process that has to happen in everybody's life if anything is going to happen. Yeah, they it's have to come to that point. It's always going to be from uh, something that I'm not fully aware of or that I haven't fully bought into yet. And it has to come to my attention somehow. Right. Whether it is a self-reflection because all of a sudden I find myself in a circumstance I cannot imagine I ever would have ended up in. Um, you know, whether broke and homeless and without relationships. Or if it's family members or loved ones, you know, saying because... Had our had our mind already been aligned that way, then we we've already this would have already happened, right, and right. so we're we're at this junction and this turning point where we have to now make this new decision. Right, and so this first step, this confession, you know, we'll say sometimes we you know commonly say confession is good for the soul, and I ask the question, well, why? Hmm. What makes it good for the soul? Mm -hmm. um, you know, David says you know in the Psalms in Psalm thirty two and stuff like that. This you know I was living under this feverish burden of a summer heat. And that, you know, I confessed these things. It was kind of like this break from the oppression. You know, this type of year in August, we can, can get familiar with the oppressive heat. And just to have relief, it's almost like confession becomes air conditioning. It becomes this lifting of this huge burden. Um, and that those are the things that happen with confession um, that I think is, is important um, to bring about the change that God wants to bring, the change that 12 Steps are emphasizing. But I mean, it's a change that God... Is trying to call us to. I um, when I saw that confession was at the heart of of kind of the what we're looking at here in the first step. I did a little bit of research and uh, found a really interesting set of studies that um, people have done about how valuable is confession just to your psychology. And uh, in a series of kind of contrived uh, experiments where people were given the opportunity to cheat and then later 
you know, give it a chance to confess about that cheating. This is, like I said, a series of different mm-hmm. things where they didn't know they were being monitored, but the researchers did know, you know, where everyone lied. What, what they found was um, that people have a real tendency to try to give a partial confession, that they want to admit that they did something that, yes, I'm in the wrong somewhere, but I don't want to give you the full extent. I want to give you, I want to, you know, not make what I did seem as extreme. Sure. And and what, what these researchers found was interesting is that people that were in that scenario within their experiments, they felt worse about themselves and about the situation than people who just out and out lied that, you know, took no responsibility for having cheated at all. And certainly those who owned up to or didn't cheat or owned up fully felt the best about the whole set of circumstances. Right. And one of their conclusions was this idea of this partial confession where, yeah, I got a little bit of a problem, but it it not only, it, 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 it keeps the person in their problem mm-hmm. and also in what they're having to cover and say about it and do about it. And they're, they're actually having to double down on the amount of time it consumes them or the amount of emotional and spiritual, you know, kind of energy and just the real value of letting it be out there. And they tied it to forgiveness. I thought was interesting. I think that maybe that's coming down the line, but that, that when you, when they find when people forgive, then that actually is what aids in forgetting because I no longer am living over those details. So in a sense, people that are kind of in between here on the confession, they're having to relive right. everything, the truth about themselves without having any chance of relief. Well, and, you know, I hear it all the time from the guys, and we probably all know it from our own experience, but um, one of the great burdens in life is dishonesty, mm-hmm. right? Because immediately when I'm dishonest, I mean, we have to keep changing the story. We have to remember the details of the story. And sometimes we will contrive one story for one person, another story for another person. Mm-hmm. I have to remember which one's which, and, how, and it becomes very complicated. The truth's simple. Mm-hmm. And then the lie is so complicated. I mean, <clears throat> if you think about it in that sense, I always tell the guys, you know, the truth is like the bullseye and the lies is everything else on the dartboard. The lies are all complicated. The truth is very simple. Mm. You know so exactly the, where it is. Yeah, right. <laughs> that's, that's the one thing. I mean, whether you're, you, you know, whether you're, you know, here on, off the truth or whether you're here off the truth, the reality is uh, not the truth is not the truth. And so uh, that everything there becomes complicated. Mm. So, uh, and you have a million and one shades of that. So yeah, that's a huge burden to keep that up. So what's the challenge in, um, in, in people coming to this point of the actual admission, the actual confession? What's, what, why, why, what's the hesitancy there? Um, well, obviously people um, have an image that they want to maintain. It's one of the things I tell the guys his way all the time is that, you know, the biggest struggle we have is we have a very overactive PR department <laughs> and we need to kind of fire our PR department because we're all working really hard to get the approval of people. We are all working very hard to get, to create an image, to create an impression. And so um, that burden is, uh, is exhausting and confession really becomes the, the firing of that PR department and the recognition that my acceptance is going to have to become um I'm going to have to entrust acceptance. That's why faith becomes an important part of this, which we talk about as these steps progress. This faith becomes really important because I have to trust that somebody's going to accept me for who I am, mm-hmm. not the image that I'm trying to portray, that I'm trying to sell. I think that's important. Now, the the admissions in this particular step, as it says, you know, we admitted that we were powerless. Mm. Um, so that becomes kind of the real focal point. The issue of... right my power over. Right, right. Powerless. And, you know, you think about that in terms of um, scripture, even, you know, in Paul, when he lines out the gospel in Romans, um, says, hey, I'm going to tell you this good news. Well, the first three chapters are all the bad news. It's all the things that are our problems and and those kind of things. Yeah, whether you're a Gentile, whether you're a Jew, right, right, we right. all have shown that we're powerless. Yeah, chapter one, all the Gentiles are a bunch of terrible people. And then, and then he turns on, on the Jews in the next chapter and says, and you do, you know, basically. You had favor, but right. it still hasn't. Right. <laughs> right. And then by the time you get to chapter three, it's this, no one does right. No one does good. And he, you know, quotes a lot from the Old Testament, just this overwhelming sense in which we are powerless to be good enough to be um, what God had intended for us to be that we're incapable of because of the fall. So 
Um, that's important. Even and then later, even Paul says in you know Romans seven, the good I want to do, I can't seem to do. The very thing I don't want to do, I seem to be doing. And there's that trap in that sense of that powerlessness. I don't seem to be able to um, muster up the strength myself to accomplish that. And that's the admission. It's simply the admission that I am powerless, which is critically important because that means I that's that be, that leads me down this path of surrender. Mm. And God can't begin to work. Yeah. in us until we can admit our inability. You know, the I was really this is really crystallized for me in the last couple of years. And now I'm teaching a Friday class for the guys who are going through Genesis. And you already have mentioned the fall and this choice that's presented and 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 we know the story with Adam and Eve. And it's just really crystallized for me that this is the primary story of the Bible mm-hmm. from the human of the human condition. Right. The very next story we have brothers killing each other. And then we have one of the descendants saying, well, you think that guy was bad? You know, my retribution is seven times. And then, you know, and then you get to the point where God surveys and says, well, you know, man is born and with wicked intent of his heart and never ends. And and then God relents a little bit on that and saying, well, that's the way it is after the flood. But I can't keep destroying the world that way. And and but just over and over again, the stories of showing the powerlessness that we have as humans to save ourselves, to be, to reach our potential, to be the ideal human as, as God intended and to drive us into the need of some sort of salvation. I mean, all of us have had people in our lives that we love dearly that are destroying themselves in some way, shape or form, primarily because they don't see what they're doing. Everyone else can see it. And yet they can't see it until they see it, until they can admit it. It's it's a hopeless situation. And that's that's where prayer comes in, I think, a lot mm-hmm. of times where I pray and appeal to God. I mean, you know, I have people close to me um, that are in that circumstance now, you know, and, and it's tough to watch them go through what they're going through. And you have to sit alongside and there's nothing you're, you can't really do anything about it until they come to this. Yeah. confession of their powerlessness, of their inability. Um, and it has to continue. Those people need to be, we need to be in community. We need to actually have relationships that you have the chance to right. someone to, to see that that blind spot or that, that weakness right. or that area you need help in. And hopefully some self-reflection and, you know, the call to be in the word and to be constantly confronted with the truth that, you know, I guess there's a way of walking away from these biblical stories going, well, I'd never do that. Well, that wouldn't be me. And it's right. like, we're just fooling ourselves, of course. Right. And one thing I know I try to do in, in our, in our Bible studies here with the guys is like, this is our story, right. <laughs> even as old and ancient, as, as far afield as it seems like it's from our reality, this is us. And it's right. speaking in that way to say, now, what are you going to do? Are you going to, you, you think you wouldn't be David looking down at Bathsheba going, Hmm, you know, maybe, maybe today's the day I, right. I, I, I inquire about her, you know, and, um, and so where does it lead us? And, and of course, David's a great example in Psalm 51 of you see the brokenness of his confession and realizing that just the, the, the death he was bringing into his life by, by pursuing that because it wasn't good for him. And, but it starts with being in community with help and also with us, you know, letting these, these, these biblical stories, you know, speak to us. Well, one of the great beauties of community as well is it gives us a mirror. Mm. You know, sometimes I don't know how bad I am until I'm with somebody else and I can begin to discover Mm -hmm. how off I am relative to the community in which I'm a part of. And so that's one of the benefits of coming here, right, is Mm. that we're creating a community that is striving at least to be more of what God would have us to be. And when a guy initially comes in here, that may not be coming in here because he wants to be, and maybe because being forced to be, but he's quickly becoming confronted with um, a mirror that's helping reflect himself to himself Mm -hmm. so that he can begin to admit, he begins to see, he begins to see things. Versus in most cases in addiction, you're in isolation. Mm -hmm. You don't see anyone but yourself. And you don't think you're that bad because, you know, you're about the same as you were yesterday and the day before and the day before that. So it's not that big of a deal. Um, but when you get in a community that gives you that mirror, and I think that's critically important. Um, that's when one of the tragedies of the kind of, the kind of things that have happened in our society that have kind of broken community Yeah. that, um, lose that opportunity to have those interactions. And, and how powerful it is to see 
someone who maybe you knew from the streets or from, you know, when you were deep in your addiction and you've seen them now, they're several months uh, ahead of you in recovery, if you will. And to see them, okay, this is now what a powerful testimony it right. is that maybe that's that mirror, that reflection I want to be now. And, right. and I can see that, you know, it's a, a kind of telling myself here when, um, when I started telling people that I was going to come work here, um, one of our uh, very uh, beloved volunteers that's here now and teaches every week. And uh, he said, let's go out to lunch. And he, he was a real good friend of mine. And uh, you, you don't know this story, but you might, you might figure out who it is. He said, I didn't know what he wanted to talk about. Just like, okay, you know, whatever, cool that you're going to do this. And he knew I was making a major shift in my career. He said, what makes you think you have the patience to, <laughs> to work with this group of guys? I said, well, I don't know, but it was really interesting. He saw in me, because, you know, of the way we work together uh, in ministry uh, that, you know, I, I, and by no means am I going to make anyone's top of the patients list of, of our staff. But what you just said really resonated that after now been here five years, yeah, I've seen, I've, I've, I've been confronted with that in ways that I never would have been in my previous work because it just wasn't the same kind of situation. Right. And, um, and, you know, it's like, I, I'm constantly having to admit to myself, yeah, I, I wasn't patient there and that wasn't good, you know, I, and the, the results of that were not anything I wanted. And so you have to keep coming back and, and so being in community and then having people tell you how important that is. And community, you know, can be, is a widely defined idea. I mean, you know, you've never been not in community. I mean, you've always, I mean, I know your life. I mean, you've always been, but sometimes we're in communities that are very loosely right. defined. And then we can be in communities that are very intensely defined. And you now think about what it says in Proverbs, you know, about as iron sharpens iron, so one man sharpens other. That's a pretty intense kind of community. And a lot of times, like in, in a professional environment, you know, people may just kind of, you know, yeah. I'm doing my job, you're doing your job. We don't really interface. Um, so we have a loose confederation, if you will, but we're not really intensely involved. Totally. You walk in a property like this and we're involved in your life and it's a whole nother kind of community. And so even over the five years you've been here, you know, there's been times when maybe things have come up and you've had to deal with things a little differently than maybe you would have in oh, yeah. your previous situation. And things would have never come up in this. It never, you just wouldn't right. have that kind of right. very personal, right. um, you know, situations with, you know, real, real heavy stakes, right. you know, in a way that's, yeah, it's, it's a very different environment. This idea of admitting our powerlessness is so critically important. Um, you know, Jesus starts it in the Beatitudes. You know, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs mm. is the kingdom of heaven. The kingdom of heaven starts when I admit my powerlessness, my poverty of spirit. Mm. Um, one of the things I tell the guys is that the kingdom of God cannot start in your life till the kingdom of you ends. Right. And that's really what this admission's about. It's about the admission. It's about it, not just admitting that I can't handle a few things. It's realizing that I'm flat broke with no way to resolve that at all. I, it's not like, you know, I'm going to kind of, um, you know, kind of get over it over time or something like that. It's the reality that um, I don't have a resource to resolve this. I have nothing within me. There's nothing out here in the world that I've seen. There's nothing I grab a hold of. It's not a little bit of time is going to make it better. It, I do not have a way to solve this at all. And that is is where the reign of God can start in your life. That's when the rule of God can start beginning to have an impact in your life, is at that moment. That's why I think this starts with admission. I think that's why Jesus says in the Beatitudes, the kingdom of God begins with this reality that I'm poor in spirit, that I'm impoverished, that I'm broke, that I'm powerless, and unman life's unmanageable. You, know, you made me think of uh, when Jesus, there's, I think it's in Luke, I'm not sure now, where uh, puts together a few little in moments when people are maybe coming to follow Jesus and his reaction seems so harsh. It's like, yeah, but I need to, I need to bury my father. Right. So well, that's very legitimate. Right. But Jesus responds like, uh, once you put your, you know, hands to this, uh, you're it, turn it back. It's just not an option. Right. And, and he's trying to point to the nature of this, this true 180 degree, completely different path. And, that means leaving right. and, and trying to have one foot on each side is just not going to work. That's repentance, right? Mm. You know, one of the things I tell you, I mean, uh, every guy in this program has admitted their powerlessness many, many times over. It's just as soon as they get a little inkling of power, they unconfess that. And so it's like, 
yeah, I messed up now. Oh, but now I got a job. I'm good now. You know, um, and and they keep what they I, I tell them sometimes they kind of get stuck in the clover leaf of repentance. It's like they're just going. You know, it's like they're exiting. They kind of admit, hey, I'm going the wrong direction. I need to get off this interstate and I'll loop around. But then as I start heading the other way, we're like, oops, so now I'm back there. And then I'm just kind of going in this little wow, yeah. um, rotary kind of situation. Um, and and, and um, John emphasizes that when he talks to people about confession, bear fruit and keep it with your repentance. You got to stick to this thing a while. You're not going to see the fruit of it for a long while off. And so just to admit for a day, admit for a week, um, that's not going to work. I have to admit every day for the rest of my life to be able to really experience the real benefit of what this very first step of change and transformation is about and really the beginning of the kingdom. It's not like, okay, I admitted that I'm powerless. Now God's kingdom started. Now I'm good. Now I'm back to powerful again. No, every day I recognize it in a deeper and deeper way, my powerlessness, my inability, mm -hmm. because so many times we come even to faith in Jesus Christ where I get broken somewhere, where I finally surrender and say, I need Jesus in my life. And I surrender and then when I get a little bit of those things back, things start coming back to me, then I start grabbing everything back up again. Um, the guys do that here. You know, you, yeah. you're kind of broke, you're homeless, everything else. But then you get home, you get some meals, you know, all of a sudden your family's talking to you again, you get a job, and all of a sudden you forget totally about your powerlessness. That's a, a confession I need to have every day for the rest of my life mm. in order to really maintain this. Yeah, and, you know, this, this message of it begins with surrender just how countercultural that is. I mean, I think even in a lot of religious circles, it's, you know, it, we, we, we talk about the triumph and the, you know, what's going to, the power that's going to come through your life. And the, but to begin with powerlessness, which of course it's, it's, it's here in the AA step one, but it is the message as you've been talking about in Jesus's ministry and Paul, all of his, what he talked about. And, you know, I, I know you've seen a lot of stories of transformation and, I imagine that some of the men who have gone through this transformation, who who have admitted this powerlessness and now have been invigorated and empowered through the through the gospel, mm -hmm. through through the power of the Spirit, um, what a strange message that is to the world! That this is not what powerful men look like. That's not our vision of powerful men. Right. And yet, now you see a, a man whose whole who is at peace with himself, who has a, a real community around him. And we know a number of those people. Um, and that's the Christian message right. is that we're, we're not going to, we're not going to be what the world expects us to be. And I have a feeling that a lot of guys coming in, uh, the sense I get is, you know, they've bought hook, line and sinker, the, the world's message about what being a powerful man looks like. Sure, absolutely. And this is completely different. Right. Right. Mm -hmm. And I mean, we saw, I think, a good demonstration of that last Sunday in our, oh, our yeah. graduation. Yeah. A very powerful guy. Right, right. On the outside. Yeah. And who was a wreck. Right. Everything about his life was a complete wreck. And right. now I just, yeah. you know, um, he stays in this house. And right. I think about him and, you know, you, you, go, you see past his room and, you know, there's the Bible on his nightstand and it's not for show. Right. You know, he is, he's committed to this truth. Boy, uh, absolutely. It's wonderful. Right, right. And the, one of the, when it comes to this confession idea too, I wanted to you know get to one of the stories that is most uh, meaningful to Christian people, to people who understand Scripture. And that's the story of the prodigal son. Mm -hmm. You know, that's a beautiful story, obviously, about somebody who takes these resources, their you know the abundance of resources, goes and squanders it all on a immoral, you know, um, riotous right, living. Right, right, and and then finds himself you know broke. Um, feed, you know, feeding pigs, maybe even wants to sneak over, maybe grab a pot of the pigs to eat, and he gets slapped down for, you know, you're not as valuable as a pig kind of thing, right? Yeah. That's as low as he gets. And he comes to his senses, it says. Comes to his senses and realizes, a servant at my dad's house is better than me now. So if I can just get back home and get to servanthood, I'll be way ahead of where I am currently. And so with that confession in mind, right, he heads back home. Mm. The thing that really strikes me about this story is, you know, he comes to his father, or he has this rehearsed thing, right? I've sinned against you and against heaven. I'm not worthy to be called your son. Let me just be a hired servant. That's his script that he's going to his father with. 
Um, as his father sees him, obviously, he leaps off the porch. He goes running to meet his son. And his son starts into his script, right? Mm -hmm. Father, I've sinned against you and against heaven. And he gets no farther. And his father stops him and puts a ring on his finger, a robe on, his, on him, sandals on his feet, and restores him to sonship. And the thing that struck me about that story, I think, is so poignant for us, is that this confession that the son comes to is rooted in a failure to understand his father, mm -hmm. right? He has, to, he has a script in which he thinks he can, maybe if he can persuade his dad, his dad might be kind enough to let him in at the bottom level of things as the lowest servant. But the father sees his son returning, who is dead in his mm -hmm. life. This isn't about it. This he can't, he can't be a servant. He's a son. That's an impossibility. You can't, you can serve, but you're not a servant. You're a son. You're always a son, right? You were dead to me long ago. Right, 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 right. right. Kind of idea. And so he totally misses the way his dad is. And that's what keeps him away so long. That's what makes his return so difficult for him. Um, and then, of course, we see the victory and the triumph in the party because of the way the father really is. Yeah. And I think that's an important part of it because we, we talk to people based upon our perception of those people. You know, you think about it for a second. If you're on the phone with somebody that you've never met, one of the first things you do is you create a picture in your mind of what they're like. Um, and then sometimes you ever meet somebody like that later. It's maybe so weird. If, yeah, it's weird to meet them because yeah. nothing like the picture, right? Yeah. Um, and that's the kind of relationship we have with God in most cases. We have this, um, as if we've never seen him, we just have this impression about what God's like. We develop a picture. And then when he really shows up, we don't recognize that, you know, and and yet it, it defines how we admit to him, how we interface with him, how we interact with him. And so, yeah, we'll be reluctant to admit if we believe that we're going to be met with harshness, with criticism, with disappointment. Mm -hmm. But what if we admit and we get a robe, a ring, sandals and a party? Yeah. And a guy running at you, meeting you. More than halfway. Right, 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 right. Exactly. Un exactly. Unbelievable. Um, and that's the beauty of the story. You know, in Exodus, you know, God reveals himself. I think in Exodus 34, when he, mm -hmm. you know, when he appears um, and he says, you know, these claims about himself. He's gracious and righteous and loving and merciful and, and he forgives sin and all these kind of things. And he proclaims that about himself. Um, and I think the passage in um, 1 John, where John encourages us in 1 John 1 to confess our sins. He says, you, you know, in order to live in the light, you need to confess your mm -hmm. sins. And you confess your sins to a father, to a God who is faithful and righteous, willing to forgive our sins yeah. and restore us. Yeah. And, and if we believe that about God, then admission becomes something we should run to. We should be eagerly embracing, not avoiding, distancing, because it's, as David realizes, this huge relief and so admission really is um, a total, it's, like, it's the beginning of vacation. It's the, be it's the beginning of, of summer. It's, it's this freshness. It should be, you know, after a long, difficult winter, the opening of the windows and the breath of fresh air that can come into my life and get rid of the stale, moldy life that I've lived and begin to lead a fresh, vibrant life really is what admission is about. And I think that's what we need to embrace. That's what we need to see. And it's all rooted in the idea of what's God like. Yeah. You know, if if God is harsh and judgmental and then you caustic, yeah. then yeah, we're afraid to. But if God is loving, he's running to meet us on the horizon, you know, boy, we should embrace that, love the idea. Mm. And that also is important in terms of our relationships with each other. You know, we have to have that kind of relationship with each other. You know, if I want somebody to be open and honest with me, I need to be able to be willing to run to the horizon. I need to be willing to have a robe and a, and, and a ring and a sandals for the people who yeah. admit to me. Show graciousness right, right. right to them. Because they need to see that, um, that character of God. Well, so what really strikes me here to coin a, uh, to use a phrase you love to use, that being struck, <laughs> that we laugh about, um, you know, there's really nothing in this kind of biblical understanding of this first step that really has a lot to do with addiction and recovery. Uh, it's just how it's applied in that way, that that's the specific focus of the powerlessness. Right. But that we all 
have this need. We all have this need to admit that we're powerless. And I'm guessing that as we go through these steps, we're gonna, that's something I can say at the end of every, every time through is like, this isn't just for a group of people that are struggling with substance abuse right. of some nature. This is about being a, a true sober living like you, like you like to talk about. Mm -hmm. That not about the substance and the chemicals in your body, but your mindset towards God, uh, your mindset towards the community and what the direction of your life is. And which is something I think we're all striving for, I hope. Mm -hmm. And um, and so here's, you know, uh, something for us to consider for in some area of our life, we're holding back in here. I mean, there's, that's always that's always the truth of sanctification. There's always something I'm keeping, you know, to myself until... I get to the point where I admit that I'm powerless over that right. and begin to change in that area. That's right. Well, I'm looking forward to going through this. I think that was really good. And I always enjoy uh, having impromptu Bible studies with you. This is a little <laughs> more structured, but I hope that it was uh, beneficial for our listeners and uh, join us again as we continue through the 12 steps. If you'd like more information about our program, please visit our website at hiswayinc.org. <laughs>